Awesome. Welcome, everyone, to the 14th SunCalp Global Summit. My name is Ariel Molino, uh, and I'm with the SunCalp team based out of Nairobi. Thank you so much for joining this session. We are really excited to, to have this conversation and host it at SunCalp. This session is doing less th with more, a global imbalance of impact investments. There should be a question mark there because I think that's what we're going to dive into. Um, I will hand it over to my colleagues, Justin and Maureen from IntelliCap, who are co-facilitating this session. Um, and we'll get us kicked off. So thanks everyone for joining. Justin, Maureen, over to you. Thank you very much, Ariel. Uh, again, allow me to uh, say good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you're joining us from. Welcome to this session. I am Justin Miato Gashera. I work for IntelliCup Advisory Services. I'm a manager who does a lot of enter enterprise support and program management. I'm happy to have you in this session. My name is Maureen Jerry Mothike. I am a senior associate at Intelecap. I have been in the impact investing space uh, for about six years. And uh, this, team, this topic is specifically interesting to me for those reasons, uh, as I have been in the space for a while and have seen the challenges and the imbalance uh, firsthand. So it seems to me that the basic VC investment model in Sub-Saharan Africa is one that mirrors advanced investment uh, ecosystems in the US and Europe, whereas we're not at that level yet. Africa is raising about 2.8 billion this year, and this is expected to grow up to 10 billion uh, by 2025, but this is nothing compared to the 300 billion that is being raised in the US, for example. In those markets, uh, it is, it's usually said that entrepreneurs get in initial support from friends, family, and uh, acquaintances, the success of this is due to having wealthy family members or a wealthy alumni network or the ability to tap into other pockets of money, such as angel investors and or crowdfunding to get the idea off the ground. Often, oftentimes, these networks and pools of funding are not of reach for entrepreneurs operating in sub-Saharan Africa. And a later stage investors need to see market traction for them to be able to invest in sub saharan Africa. Mm -hmm. But without that initial 10,000, 50,000 seed stage investment, how do we expect uh, a viable pipeline to develop for later stage invest investors? We'll look at how these smaller ticket sizes can be catalytic for some entrepreneurs, but because they cost too much money from the investor perspective, are rarely executed. Is there a global imbalance of uh, some entrepreneurs getting more with less traction that we see in Sub-Saharan Africa? I guess if you're here to answer that question, we'll be able to delve into that with our panel, with our panelists. With us, we have uh, three panelists. We have Philip Teveron, who is a US food veteran uh, who in the, in the 80s introduced quinoa, quinoa and uh, is also a brand manager, manager at Dylan and Deluc, um, has helped entrepreneurs turn ideas into food businesses. And in 2017, he, he partnered with uh, Chef Pierre to establish Shirel, which is a US-based food company, uh, helping smallholder farmers with local and global markets. Then we also have Grace Nalugwa, who is a founder and CEO of Gracela Ventures Limited, a renewable energy company providing carbonizing briquettes uh, for alternative cooking fuel. In 2022, she was uh, also a fellow at Mandela Washington Fellow and uh, has been involved in bioenergy circular economy from the University of Maryland. She has been on a couple of accelerator programs and she will share her experiences uh, for this and how she has gotten investment. We also have uh, Esther Deti, who is the head of investments at uh, Unicab. Over, she has over 10 uh, years experience in investment and uh, SME sector development, and is also the executive director for East, Af East Africa Venture Capital Association. Welcome guys, and looking forward to the conversation. Awesome. Um, so as you've heard, these are the three panelists for this session, and we're going to have several questions which, which we feel are going to spur the conversation as uh, we, we, we thought about it. So. Allow me to start with Esther Ndeti. So Esther, you have been in this space for some time and uh, wanted to understand a bit about the investment landscape from uh, how you see it. You have been dealing with early stage financing 
fairly small ticket size investments. But then do you think this Western model of venture capital is one that need a, a reinvention for sub-Saharan Africa? I mean, yes, thank, thank you for that uh, introduction and for having me speak um, on this panel. Um, I should just quickly say that I am not the executive director of the East Africa Venture Capital Association, but I was for five years. <laughs> and, and, and it's precisely because I had that bird's eye view for, over the investment landscape across East Africa um, that, you know, uh, I was able to see sort of like the evolution of uh, capital, uh, the deployment of it and its impact on businesses across East Africa over a period of time. Um, I should also qualify that prior to that, um, I was with the uh, another network of investors, but I started my journey as an entrepreneur. So I like to call myself a recovering entrepreneur <laughs> and I have a lot of respect uh, and a lot of sort of like awe. I mean, all of entrepreneurs who've been able to build businesses and run them to date. Uh, one of my key lessons when I was trying to, um, you know, run two businesses um, over different periods of years was the information gap with, with regards to, you know, what capital is available out there um, and what capital is relevant at every stage of business. And, I, you know, that's something I see that continuously is a challenge, um, sort of like, you know, finding businesses, you know, seeking out um, short-term debt um, for long-term milestones and uh, growth, you know, projects within the business, um, or, you know, you're still within your research and development. And because of the shallow uh, sources of capital in East Africa, you know, finding yourself, you know, either doing, you know, debt or venture capital for, you know, a stage of a business that probably isn't, you know, quite ready for that kind of capital out there. You know, I, I, I speak from experience having been there, but also from, you know, working with various um, investors across East Africa um, and being able to understand the challenges both on the entrepreneur side and on the investor side. So, you know, at, at funds trying to set up, um, you know, uh, vehicles in East Africa, investing in innovative businesses, but, you know, the vehicles that they've set up are, as you've mentioned, you know, structured in, you know, more traditional, more Silicon Valley um sort of like you know way um but realizing that in in africa in general you know not all businesses actually a majority of the business businesses will not fit within those models uh, for various reasons um where you're talking about you know quit putting you know a, a sum of money um trying to grow it to you know five to ten x within three to five seven years maybe uh and making a multiple uh, back to your original investors the lps and for your fund as well um but you know in, in a you know you're in a market where you have to do lots of market development alongside sort of like you know um you know creating value for the business so there's a lot that needs to be done um and this is not for all types of businesses but you'll find that a significant number of businesses um you know have need a lot of intervention and then you have also a scenario where you know the western world has um options you know when people talk about friends fff in fact it's not even friends and family what it, what it says is friends family and fools we can't even afford to have the third f in africa we have friends and family and the, those friends and family as well don't have the disposable income that you know our friends out in the west or other parts of the world have um you know that we, we don't have the you know facilities the you know r d grant facilities out there so the early stage capital side of things is not developed to the point where you know the, the next layer of investors can come in and be able to just now offset and take get you know great pipeline of businesses um and that's why i sort of like moved to unconventional capital you know very focused on very very small early stage businesses giving them that first ticket you know fifty thousand dollars um you know fifty thousand dollars to somebody I, i've had this conversation on many many times for those with networks in the west $50,000 is probably something you can raise within, you know, a, a good circle of friends. $50,000 in Kenya is 5 million plus shillings. Uh, and sometimes I like to bring it down to local capital because I know uh, back in, you know, my previous life, we would talk about um, somebody says that I'm an early stage investor and my sweet spot is $2 million. What is $2 million in Kenya shillings? 200 million Kenya shillings, right? Let's let's contextualize and localize um, some of these things for it to be more um, you know, 
um, more sort of like, I'm um, sorry, man, my laptop seems to be running out of charge, but to be more, um, up, you know, uh, um, palatable, right? So I think there's many things that I, I liked Maureen's introduction because she touched on quite a number of things that I would, you know, add on to. But I think, you know, I think just really focusing on what is the local context, um, how shallow our early stage capital Okay, um, seems like uh, uh, power has taken uh, over uh, Esther's uh, laptop, but that's fine. I think she had covered a lot of things. And it's good for investors in the house to realize that it, it will be very unfair for you to expect Silicon Valley kind of models in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, not because they can't get there, but because of uh, underlying challenges that they uh, get as they continue to progress. Um, and allow me also to now come to you, Grace. You are a young entrepreneur who has been able to raise some smaller ticket sizes uh, and investments that, were, that have been very instrumental to the growth of your business. Uh, it would be unfair for me not to state that uh, you've been able to raise or increase your annual turnover to about you know, 10 times uh, the value that it was before after getting capital injection of about you know, 12 12,000 uh, and a further 6,000 in accelerator programs. So that is incredible. That we have to you know, applaud because that's a, a big milestone. So tell us more about that investment. How has it changed your business? And probably how are you able to get uh, you know, that opportunity? Thank you, Justin. Uh, I'm so glad to be on this platform. As introduced before, Chris Nalugwa. So I got uh, that funding in 2021 when we were just recovering from COVID-19. It was, um, you know, for, for, for startups here in Africa and here in Uganda specifically, that was a great move for my company because, you know, starting a business as one person, as Esther said, we don't have friends and family who can support us. So you have a very brilliant idea, but no one can even see the beauty of the idea you're having. So you have to look here and there to see that you can get the funding. Surprisingly to my business, it was by surprise that I got the funding because I went into an accelerator, the West to Value Accelerator Program for East Africa. They wanted only five participants. And when I applied, I missed the first time. I got apologies. Then one week to, to, the, to the interviews, I was reached again that I was still interested. I was like, wow, this is great for me. I said, yes, I'm, I am. So preparing for the interviews and then going for the uh, interviews, still I didn't make it. But I was happy enough that a startup doesn't only need money, but also the knowledge that you can get from the accelerators is, is as good as the money that you can get anyway. So a few weeks after, I was reached that, you know, you, you didn't make it to the funding, but we can give you technical assistance. I was like, wow, this is great for me. So along the way, uh, it's, it's called Bestseller Foundation. So along the way, they saw progress in the knowledge that they shared. And what I think maybe they thought if we could give this person the money as well, it could make more sense than only the knowledge. So I just got funding just by luck but not that I was ready for that funding. But that funding has taken us miles since 2021 to date. It's only one year, but we are just doing wonders. Because before getting funding, we were doing production. I do produce briquettes. I'm into renewable energy. So I produce briquettes as an alternative cooking fuel for charcoal and firewood, because over 90% of our population uses charcoal and firewood for cooking. And the government has just banned the use of charcoal and cutting down trees for charcoal because of the climate change current situation. So I got funding because previously we were producing only 200 kilograms of briquettes per day. And the market was uh, rated to that because we could only reach to only those 200 people, like to sell to those 200 kilograms and we had a very small space that could accommodate only 600 kilograms at a time meaning that briquettes take four days to dry so you can only produce 600 meaning you can only produce only three days in a week it was so small for us 
but with the funding that we got, uh, we've been able to buy big machinery. So we can now produce 200, sorry, two tons of briquettes per day. And we've expanded our space to three tons at a time. So it's, it's, it's a big step that we've moved within the one year. And this has exposed us to so many customers out there because people didn't think we could produce the good briquettes and then we could make the, uh, the demand that they need. But now this funding has pushed us to B2B customers. As for now, we have demands of over 70 tons per month, which we cannot even make just because we got the machine. So uh, this small funding helped us to get off the ground. So it helped us to position us in a place where now you can justify why you need funding and how you're going to use the funding and how you can convince the markets out there that yes, I can be able to supply you ABCD and then you come back doors and work out things and see how you can tap into that market and don't let it go just like that. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Grace, for that, uh, you know, sharing that experience. Um, from, you know, building from what you've just said, and again, from what Esther had said, um, whatever people consider small might not be small to an entrepreneur in sub-Saharan Africa and even in some regions as well. Of, uh, uh, and one of the uh, taking points is uh, as an entrepreneur, never lose hope. Uh, you know, try and get those opportunities, try and apply. I know is a good thing because, again, it means that person reviewed. Uh, but also it's not... As much as we're discussing about access to capital, even getting technical assistance does prepare you to now getting access to capital. So, Philip, on the other hand, um, uh, Yolele has also had his own experience. And uh, from your end, we'd like to hear more about your fundraising journey. Um, I'm not sure whether you had the opportunity to deal with the three Fs that Esther was talking about, but then... Just give us uh, an experience of how Yolele got its initial seed capital uh, to now propel the business off the ground. Thank you for the question. Uh, so we do, and we did in fact benefit from friends and family. Uh, we, my partner, uh, Pierre, is a chef who from Senegal moved to from Senegal to the US to be a college student and instead found himself working in restaurant kitchens. And he and I became friendly. He had made a name for himself as a leading African chef and he had this vision. And when I heard him talk about this vision to bring traditional crops to global markets, uh, I knew that I could help him. And we, we knew that we didn't have a lot of resources between us and we, while we're entrepreneurs and have some tolerance of risk, uh, we also weren't willing to bet the farm, as they say. So we knew that the way we were going to achieve something was through partnerships, that we had to focus on what we can do and what we can do well, and to partner with other organizations that can complement our skills and our strengths uh, and fill in our weaknesses. So the first thing we did was understand that in order to bring in an ancient grain from West Africa to the U.S. and pack it up under our brand and distribute it which to retailers around this country, we knew that it took a, a fair amount of uh, resources, including cash, but also including uh, capabilities in compliance and logistics and importation and we didn't have those capabilities so we kind of canvassed the the universe of companies that are engaged in those activities and reached out to ones that we know uh, and presented what we thought was a great impact opportunity primarily as well as a commercial opportunity and we found a company that agreed with us that this seemed like a great idea and they devoted their resources to kind of establishing the platform that allow that would allow us to execute on our vision now it was still us and we had to still devote the resources that we did have uh and we were 
really fortunate to have friends and family that we could turn to uh, for whatever cash we needed to at least get off the ground, which in the scale of the US was minimal, uh, very small amount of cash that we that we started with. Uh, but at least it allowed us to uh, get started and demonstrate that this is possible. It's possible to put an ancient African grain into a store in the US and have people buy it. Uh, and then once we were able to demonstrate that it, the thesis is true, then we were able to build upon that uh, and uh, get a little bit, get more friends and family money to support us. Because I guess the hard the hard truth here is that yes, friends and fam we found that friends and family were absolutely essential to fund our growth. And we're now selling our product in thousands of stores across the US. And we've gotten it used in industrial ways. And we, we've advanced in uh, many different fronts. Um, but through all of this, until very lately, we have not found a real appetite for commercial investment in what we're doing, despite the traction. And I suspect that's due to uh, appetite for risk among investors, lack of appetite for risk among investors, and uh, real appetite for greed as opposed to impact. <laughs> I'm going to be frank. I'm just going to be frank, and I'll pause there. Oh, that's great, Philip. Yeah, and I think the imbalances are quite clear from the stories that we hear from Philip to Grace and even con uh, sentiments from Esther about the imbalances. And we see this uh, as re research shows that in the US, pre-seed funding rounds are on average half a million dollars and seed rounds about $4 million. Within the enterprise uh, enterprises in South uh, network across Asia and Africa, an average company is able to raise uh, less than half, uh, less than a million dollars with four years of operation. And even as Philip is mentioning that even after the traction that they've gained over the period of time, they're still not able to get commercial investment. Usually the companies that are, we see are raising on average about 200 uh, to 300,000 in the first year, uh, in the first major raise, uh, capital raise. And that's a big difference uh, between 200,000 to 400, $4 million. Uh, that's a very big difference if you think about it. I would want to come to you, Philip, and ask, what are some of the unique differences that you've seen across the two markets uh, in fundraising uh, in both markets, considering that your operates uh, or its, base, its operations are based in the US as well as Senegal? What are some of the differences that you have been able to clearly see when you've tried to raise in the two countries? Well, the... The funders that we have dealt with here in the U.S. have largely been venture capital funds focused on consumer packaged goods, because that's the essential nature of our business here. But what we learned upon entering our business is that we had to be more ambitious than that, and we had to be involved in, on the supply side and in developing a supply chain and in West Africa. And that led us to funders that were more oriented towards impact, and they tended to be Europe, European-based funds uh, oriented towards impact in sub-Saharan Africa, uh, some U.S. as well. So we, we actually ultimately found uh, a more harmony, a better match with impact-oriented funds orient, uh, with a focus on sub-Saharan Africa than we have in uh, venture capital funds based in North America or even in Europe uh, if they're focused on CPG, consumer packaged goods. We actually received funding from a USAID program, West Africa Trade and Investment Hub, uh, and we have had a lot of ongoing interesting conversations with Europe-based funds focused on impact 
uh, and some U.S.-based funds uh, focused on impact. But that's been our sweet spot, impact-oriented funds. And even there, there seems to be uh, what, what to us is, uh, how, do you, how do you put it, a conflict between the stated intent of the fund, which is to achieve impact, be, in some cases, they say, we're first risk capital, and yet, uh, where's the risk? They want to have all their risk eliminated, right? Like, no risk, but there, but this seems to be a conflict to us. Uh, but yet there are. We have found we have found investors that seem to be willing to take risk. Finally, five years later. Wow, uh, it didn't take long enough. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, so this is quite interesting, and I guess it's a very different experience uh, having raised in the U.S. and uh, things or the venture capital base that you have to focus on. And I guess impact investing is what is fit for sub-Saharan Africa. And I guess we're not seeing most of those, or even if we're seeing most of those, then uh, the aspect of de-risking investment for Africa becomes very challenging. And I guess that's a question that we can delve into uh, with Esther at some point. But then for Grace, I would want to kind of like come to the differences. Uh, having had Philip's experience with fundraising in this, uh, in this different market from you, how do you think sub-Saharan African entrepreneurs are asking for enough money? Do you think they're asking for too little? Do you think they have the knowledge that they could get more money even uh, then? And then not only the knowledge, uh, do they have the capacity or are their businesses able to attract that money, do you think? Yes. Thank you, Maureen. The answer is no, according to me. <laughs> Because one, it's a miracle, an African startup getting funding from wherever you're getting it. Personally, I saw it as a miracle, having been considered for that investment that I got in my business. So uh, the point is, entrepreneurs here have so many ideas. They have a bigger picture of what they want to achieve. But then you find that investors advertise that they are willing to offer 10,000 US dollars, 20,000 US dollars, 15,000. So it triggers an entrepreneur's mind to, to scroll down to, to fit their budget into that small amount of money. So it limits us to think ahead, to think outside the box, to think that we can put up very big startups. I've been in the US, I've been in Maryland, I came back last month, but the experience I saw there was investors invest more in research and development, whereby if they see an entrepreneur having a very brilliant idea that can be of great impact to the continent, they invest in as much as they can, even if they don't make money instantly, they make sure that they develop that idea, they develop the company, even if it takes five years to invest in that to come out with one good product they do that whereas here in africa however good your idea may be the investor is not ready to invest into that good idea so you have to struggle by your own so you ask for that twenty thousand because it's what they are offering so you figure out what can i do in this twenty thousand remember it's only going to meet like twenty percent of what you need to achieve the ultimate goal at the end of the day so you end up doing very little, and sometimes entrepreneurs lose track along the way because you get that 20,000, you have terms and conditions to the investor. Uh, some investors say that if they give you money, you should not look for other funds, you should first consult them. It's a lot of protocol in there. So it limits an entrepreneur to go and look for another investor to invest into the business. And even if you, you can go and find other investors, it becomes hard for an entrepreneur to go and look again for more funding to, to fund the same idea. And yet, if that concept that is being used in the developed world could be brought back here in Africa, because there are some brilliant ideas that can even change Africa, that can solve so many problems here in Africa. But if you have very little funding, you can't even reach... Uh, 
thirty percent of the the ultimate goal, you can't reach the problem even a quarter way. So it becomes very hard for us to achieve the project as we see entrepreneurs out there doing it in the developed world. Okay, perfect. Uh, I think that's very clear. I think that's the sentiment across the board. I do have a contrary uh, question. So to, this is to Esther. Uh, we are saying that some companies are not raising much, but then uh, clearly some companies are, are raising a big amount of money. We have seen companies raise even up to a million uh, US dollars, even here in Kenya. And uh, sometimes they will, they will fail. The, the companies will fail even uh, without closing to a year. So do you think uh, some companies are meant to make it and some are not? And what's the, or is, there, or is, is this a representation of a fundamental problem or a deeper problem to access to capital that you see in the region? Here's a fun fact, companies fail. <laughs> <laughs> so um, companies fail in every part of the world. In fact, the statistic is only um, a third and sometimes less than a third of a, comp of a portfolio of companies and any investor will, will, will succeed. So we need to recognize that um, not, not everybody, regardless of capital attracted or, you know, very many things play into this. So market dynamics, um, you know, people are out here trying to build new products, you're testing a new market. Um, it might succeed, it might fail. That, that's just the reality of things. Um, in terms of um, are they able to raise up to $1 million? Again, many factors come into this. Um, dig deeper. So do they have the networks, for instance? Um, I think Philip mentioned his co-founder, um, you know, was from Senegal, but then had, you know, this background in the U.S. and so was able to activate the networks there. So, you know, some of these founders have networks that they're able to activate um, or, Oh, it's a timing thing. So maybe there's a big push uh, in the impact space around the intersection of climate and tech and somehow your business somehow sits within that. Um, there's very many things that play into this, but are there biases? Yes, there are biases. Uh, data shows us that there's um, bias towards uh, businesses that have um, male founders um, as opposed to female founders. There's biases towards people who are um, expatriates, for instance. And I think that also just ties in with also, you know, if you look at their capital um, their cap tables, uh, they're able to raise some money from their friends and family. All these things actually make sense because so they can they really de risk their business to a point. And so they're more attractive to sort of like the you know the venture capital investors out there. Um, so I, I don't like to compare apples and oranges. I, I like to, you know, so how what are the solutions that are out there? Um, ANCAP is, you know, we looked at uh, unconventional capital looked out there. And so, and so not enough businesses have that first ticket um, and just to be able to de-risk themselves and prove that they're able to grow to a certain point to attract further capital. Um, another thing that I'm seeing increasingly is, is uh, the participation of local capital. So we're now seeing increased number of angels out there. Um, this is also important, right? Um, because then you can show, they can bring in the expertise and the knowledge local knowledge of um, on the ground to be able to sort of like help these businesses be more attractive um, in the long run and to be able to uh, sort of like understand the lay of the land as well. All these things are important. Um, you know, we're seeing venture labs being set up. Um, you know, there's many ways to skin a cat and I'd rather focus on that. If we sit here and talk about businesses, they got one million, they failed and we'll be here forever. And the fact is these things happen across the world. Um, what are we doing to solve the, the, the problems, the challenges that are out there? And the good news is that there are there are solutions that are slowly cropping up. It's difficult um, because, and I'll go back to Philip's point. Um, Philip, you talked about risk capital, not really taking the risk. And, you know, I'll take one for the VCs, although I'm not a typical VC, I'm not really a VC, but I, I've seen firsthand how difficult it is to raise capital for funds in Africa. And some of this sits squarely on the on the institutional investors that they raise money from, the LPs out there. So you're trying to come up with an, first of all, let's start with less than 1% of rate funds raised globally is earmarked for Africa, less than 1% that we should know have this fact, um, you know. And then on top of that, these are, you know, VCs raise their money from either, okay, the better kinds are, you know, the, sort of the more understanding, risk-accepting um, kind of LPs would be family offices and, you know, 
you know, <laughs> places where you can be able to really or, or negotiate and, you know, talk and really raise your case um, with individuals. But then there's institutional institutions out there, um, you know, um, pension funds <laughs> and other things um, from the West who the risk appetite isn't that high. <laughs> so you can imagine by the time it trickles down to the fund and then trickles down to the entrepreneurs. I mean, I've seen people try to create alternative structures because we've been able to see over the past 20 years that this is not working. So alternative structures are being, you know, um, created, but raising for those funds is very difficult as well. So, I mean, we've noted the biases. There's still biases ongoing. I'm not going to um, sort of like try and um, uh, whitewash that. But at the same time, you know, what solutions are out there? So, yes, um, you know, what I really like also is that there's data nowadays. Um, Ten years ago, you know, you couldn't, you couldn't, you didn't know. You'd hear somebody raised something from somewhere. You don't know what or why, right? Now we have data in terms of what companies are raising, where they're raising from, what amounts, what are the sectors of interest. You're able to sort of like use this uh, as fuel to be able to also figure out where to start um I don't know, you know, fundraising or, you know, where to sort of like think about um, uh, capital. Yeah. So, sorry, I, I, mean, I know I should have probably um, agreed with you, but um, I just wanted to just throw that in there. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Esther, for that. Um, remember, it's, it's, it's from your experience, definitely. Therefore, we cannot echo uh, much than what you've just said. So um, one of the things that we also have to understand uh, is that the market in sub-Saharan Africa is unprecedented. We have uh, great opportunities, very innovative uh, intervention and businesses. The quality is very high, and most of them are trying to create positive economic uh, impact and growth. And they have that ability to be scaled up. However, um, due to the limitations that you know Esther has mentioned, you know there's things around. How, where do you have robust networks? Do you, uh, is the timing right? And the bias that uh, also uh, revolve around uh, you know funding. Uh, those challenges do affect entrepreneurs from hitting these milestones. However, there's also a need for entrepreneurs to look at them as opportunities. So if you understand that lack of a robust network is uh, you know does affect you there's need for you to be a bit intentional and try to seek or find these networks wherever they are but then you need to try and find it you need to do a bit of research so that you can uh, narrow the information gap that i think philip had uh, outlined and also there's need for you to understand the timing and understand which agenda is being pushed and therefore is this the right time for me to try and seek and access uh, finances and um, before we now open uh, the discussion to the audience, uh, you know, for them to raise their questions, I would like to uh, give each panelist a uh, platform. Um, one, to ask. Remember, we have a pool of investors and entrepreneurs in the room. Therefore, to an investor or investors who are here, what would be the one thing that you want to ask, ask them? Based on your experience, what is that one thing that you'd like to ask them? And then to the entrepreneurs, what is this thing you offer them advice? What is this thing that you think they need to know or understand as they get to this, you know, uh, experience of trying to seek for financing? So I'll start with um, uh, Philip. Uh, then we're going to go to Grace and then uh, Esther. Before now, we open it up for the audience questions. Thank you. Well, I'll I'll start with the second question. So uh, I think it's important to. Uh, consider sectors. Uh, Esther, you had just talked about sectors, and I think business sector and investment sector and the match between those two. And what what I guess what we seem to have found is that uh, if your if your business is in technology, then you're well suited to uh, investors whose motivation is to get a return on capital because technology lends itself to super high profits and there's the relationship between risk and reward. You're going to put, if you put some money into, uh, I guess the nature of venture capital is you put a bunch of money into a bunch of different ventures and if one of them is a runaway success, then you've done your job well. Um, but in the sector that we're in, which is kind of agriculture and and packaged foods, then the scalability, it's still scalable, but it's not scalable in the same way because it just means you have to make more. Uh, like Grace, you have to make more briquettes. 
in order to make more money. And there's a physical restraint there. Um, and what we found is that venture capital is not so interested in that phys the physical limitations of the real world, uh, that, uh, but, uh, but impact capital is. And in particular in sub-Saharan Africa, impact capital is really interested in agriculture because agriculture represents such a large segment of the overall economy, I guess, and the employment of people on the continent, um, which takes, I guess, me to uh, the world of investors and asking. And uh, I guess I gave a hint uh, a little bit earlier that the ask is to be uh, accepting of perhaps a greater degree of risk if you are an impact investor, if your responsibility, your fiscal responsibility is not simply to maximize return on capital, but to achieve certain impact goals, and your, and your geography is sub-Saharan Africa, then you have to be willing to accept some degree of risk. And because generally the dollars are very low, it seems like it's reasonable to accept some degree of risk. You're not, you're not putting that much out there. Um, so I guess that would be the, the focus. And also to, when considering what is risk and what is not risk, to, in our case, uh, we have partnerships, right? We focus on partnerships in North America. We focus on partnerships in West Africa. And we're starting a greenfield project in agro-processing. So in a sense, wow, that's greenfield. No one, it's not, it's a factory. That's an idea. No one's even built it yet. But we've spec'd out all the costs. We've have partners who are currently operating agro-processing. They have established grower networks. We've established a distribution network. So you would think that that has de-risked a lot. And yet, from an investment point, an investor point of view, even an impact investor point of view, that's just a greenfield project, plain and simple, and therefore risky. And for us, the algebra doesn't seem to work in that way. Yeah, yeah. I, I thank you. Thank you, Philip, for that. Uh, I think this risk aspect uh, needs to be demystified. Um, uh, so allow me to also throw this the same question, the ask and the offer to Grace. Uh, share insights and uh, yeah, over to you, Grace. Sorry? Yeah. Thank you, Justin. Well, uh, my ask that I would have for investors is uh, I would ask investors to to adjust to their terms and conditions. For instance, if you're offering investment of fifty thousand US dollars, and when when you sit down with an entrepreneur or the enterprise, and you see that they can do more than that, uh, I'm just requesting investors to be to be flexible. Yeah, the right word is flexible because you might find that you've, you've advertised for 50,000 US dollars that you're giving out, yes. But when you look at the entire idea, it can take about 15,000, sorry, 150,000 or 200,000 US dollars. So investors should be ready to adjust and then have time to meet with these uh, entrepreneurs because what I've seen is most investors take us through a training session. We really need that because we, we see uh, the opportunities of funding, but sometimes entrepreneurs don't have the knowledge on what they're going into. So uh, investors should engage entrepreneurs and then have deeper discussions and then agree on what are we funding and what is the end result of this financing rather than sticking on what I tell you I want and you know you're going to find very little of what i want or you're going to find so much yet i need little so there should be an interaction between the two to agree on what to invest and how and when and you know some kind of relationship in there and then the advice that i would have for entrepreneurs i have three advices number one is no is just an activation for yes 
So we, we go for so many opportunities. You apply here and there. You speak to person A and person B. When person A says no, it doesn't limit you from going ahead to person B. Because maybe person A didn't understand what you were talking about. So you go ahead and talk to person B. If person B doesn't accept still, move ahead and go to person C. So if someone says no, you shouldn't say, okay, these things don't work. Let me just give up. Never. When no, you just activate your yes. You just check yourself. Why did this person say no? Uh, it happened to me one time. I applied for a funding and then I was asked a question. I didn't even have an idea. I was asked about the break even i didn't even know what break even was so the answer i gave there was so silly so i just looked at myself after getting results that i didn't make it so i went through my application and i saw that the problem was me it wasn't the investor so you check yourself you keep on applying 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 so one day one time the no is going to become a yes and for my case still i was given a no for the impact investment by the West Value Accelerator Program. But I accepted the no and I said, okay, thank you so much. But the no now became a yes. So we shouldn't lose hope when we are told no, we just have to push on. The other thing is entrepreneurs, we only think about money. We don't care about knowledge. But what I realized is you better invest in knowledge than even money. Because when if you know what you want to do and how you're going to do it, when you get money, it becomes easy. But sometimes entrepreneurs will only focus on getting that money. Little do you know even how you should navigate, how, what languages do investors speak? When an, an investor asks this question, what do they mean? So we need to inter make ourselves familiar with knowledge. Let's go for more knowledge and then the money will we shall get the money. If you know what you want, you get the money automatically. And uh, the last thing is, is, it's not only money that grows the business. The knowledge also grows the business. And the team that you're working with does a, a, great, a great impact to the business. You may have a team of five, but you may not all have the same vision, the same goal. Some people come in because they think this venture can attract funding. And when we get funding, I can get this portion. So some of our partners are here to share on the funding that we raise. So out of the team, because an entrepreneur, you can't do everything alone. You need someone because you have to look for funding. You have to do operations and all the other things that a startup must do. So having a team, you should have at least one person with whom you share a vision. And then you distribute your roles among the two or three people so that you can be able to balance the operations, to think, to innovate for the business, and also to look for funding so that you can keep things moving at the same time. That's what I had for. Thank you. Thank you, Grace. Wow. I love that part of a noise and activation for yes. I hope investors or rather entrepreneurs in the room are, uh, you know, they're getting that psyched up and the morale is high up. So again, the same question for uh, to Esther. Uh, your ask and your offer. Yeah, sorry, I was just taking notes from Philip and Grace. <laughs> um, so thank you both for sharing that. Uh, I think Philip, I'd be really keen to sort of like, you know, have a bit of a back and forth on sort of like, you know, the risk um, um, conversation you've raised uh, and also sort of like understand where, how, there's a difference between perceived risk and real risk and how that can really affect your fundraising. And I completely empathize with that. Uh, with Grace, I think, you know, you talked a lot about fundraising strategy and how you can collect feedback to really build your pitch to, you know, more investors out there. I think it was Ken Jaroge who talked about, um, he did 400 pitches. Um, so Ken Jaroge is a founder of, of Cellulant, uh, I think, which raised uh, quite a significant amount of capital at some point um, and has operations across Africa. So he did 400 pitches to investors across 
um, a period of two years. And so I think he can sort of like really speak to, you know, really taking feedback and taking any of it and using uh, the no as an activation for yes, um, Grace. Um, so, you know, thank you both for your comments. I think for me, my ask is my offer. Um, maybe a little bit more about unconventional capital. So we try to do things differently. We've taken out the in-person pitches. Um, you sort of just do a remote application on our website. It's open to everybody. Um, we are looking at very, very early stage businesses. Um, and, and, you know, you're looking for your first $50,000, um, you know, where the people for, for you Um so we're not, you know, sophisticated growth capital investors. So Philip, unfortunately, we're not the fund for you. Um, <laughs> but, you know, if you're an early stage entrepreneur, we would love to sort of like have an application from you. We are sector agnostic. We are, we are active in four countries, Nigeria, Uganda, Rwanda and, and Kenya. Um, I have a soft spot for Uganda because, uh, you know, I, I did a bit of schooling there, um, but, but I'm Kenyan. So, <laughs> um, you know, and also we do revenue based financing where we basically buy up, um, a, a bit of, of a stake in your business, not more than 10 percent. And what you do is you buy back your stake completely. Um, it's self liquidating. You buy back your 10 percent using your revenues over a period of time. Um, our, our investment period stretches up to 10 years um, because we understand that, you know, businesses, uh, you know, VC is built uh, for tech businesses and it, it's understandable why you're thinking of scale and growth and, um, you know, returns on those investments um, on a faster turnaround. But we are, you know, looking at businesses that are hardware based, um, that are tangible products and, you know, labor services as well. I'm really expanding that scope of investments that we're looking for, uh, just because we find that that's where the need for the capital sits. Um, and, you know, so I'm happy to talk about uh, Anchor. My ask is my offer. Um, let entrepreneurs know, because uh, I think one of the biggest issues is sort of like just really knowing where do I access this capital? Um, a, a huge uh, number of entrepreneurs still think about investments as loans. Um, you know, they talk to a few lending institutions, get frustrated. Um, you know, so just being able to really expand, um, share what you learn, what you know from these calls, um, direct them to ANCAP if you want. Um, our call for applications closes later this, at the end of this week. But, you know, um, we still take applications across um, the year um, for consideration. So, yeah, I hope I haven't taken too much of your time, but really um, reach out to ANCAP. <laughs> Okay, perfect. I think we've had uh, quite a few points that kind of add to the, the topic in both ends. So the imbalance and how we can be able to provide solutions as entrepreneurs, it's also the uh, investors in, in, the, in the space. There's a question coming into the comment uh, and uh, let me get the person's name. Banada uh, asks, do you consider that part of the problem lies in communication? Both entrepreneurs and investors seem to be working uh, towards the same goal, that is, quote-unquote, creating impact. However, from our experience advising enterprises in scaling up processes, every time we realize that investors and entrepreneurs speak different languages, and that becomes the main issue when raising funds to scale. So I guess we can all have like uh, a comment about, uh, about the question. We can start with you, Philip. Uh Yes, and Grace referred to it earlier. Uh, uh, yes, we found, like you, Grace, we found it's uh, imperative to understand the language of our interlocutors, right? Uh, they, they have very specific questions. They know what they mean. We don't know what they mean. We better learn uh, their language. And, uh, uh, and it, has, it helps a lot uh, when you're able to use terms that investors use all the time. And we as entrepreneurs are not thinking like that, but you have to get into the, the shoes or the head of the people that you're hoping to partner with. You want to understand what motivates them and what they're thinking about. So 100%, it's imperative to learn uh, and to... Uh, to put yourself in the position of the investor. Uh, and I try to do that, Esther. <laughs> Chris, uh, we can get your comments. You've already alluded to it. So maybe you can finalize your thoughts. 
Yeah, I mentioned that earlier. It's true, we lack communication between the two of us. Because some investors look at uh, return on investment. And then me, I look at something different. So we fail to understand each other. But still, this is an advice entrepreneurs that let's keep going for applications. Wherever you see a call for application, apply. Not because you're going to get that funding, but getting exposed to how do, how do investors ask questions. When they ask this, what do they mean? When they ask this way, what do I answer? You find that they all need the same answers, but the structure of the questions differs. So we should make ourselves familiar with those things. I personally, I applied for Mandela Washington Fellowship since 2017, but have not been answering questions the way I should answer them. Until when I got practice, Mandela Washington, Echo Wing Green, so many, so many, so many calls for applications. But whenever you go through them, you see the language they speak. It's always the same language. Impact investment, venture capitalists, what? So just learning what do they ask, what do they want, what do they mean by this, and then you can have the money. Ah, perfect. Yes, uh, I think break even, you've now learned how break even is and return on investment and stuff like that. So uh, I can go to you, Esther, for the same question. I mean, I think the two, uh, both Philip and Grace have covered this, but I'll just give a quick, I like to use examples. It, it's, it's quite, it, it takes me back to about seven, eight years ago. Um, there's this brilliant business, um, this founder uh, had this um, health centers um, in various informal settlements um, and being able to really, you know, meet, the, um, you know, the need at, right at the bottom of the pyramid and sort of like be able to give them um, subscription like services for, you know, healthcare and, you know, and just really, but this guy had never heard the word, word impact. <laughs> so when, when he was talking to some investors, um, they were like, are you an impact business? Are you impact based? like, no, <laughs> you know. Um, so really, you know, and, and one of one of other grace of Philip alluded to it, and it's true. Like the terms out there that obviously this has picked up, and don't forget, um, impact was coined in two thousand, I think, two thousand and ten, uh, by the Rockefeller Foundation, and then um, grew over the years. But there was a point when this was it two thousand and ten or two thousand one of the two, um, uh, you know, and then there are people who are queued into these networks and and able to really quickly you know, get them and use them in the terminology and the business cases. And, but then the entrepreneur down there is busy building his business is not keeping up to, you know, what is happening in the, you know, in the investment space. Um, that being said, um, I think work needs to be done on both sides. I think, yes, entrepreneurs need to work and figure, you know, really understand the terminology that's used um, by investors and by financiers out there. But also I think um, investors also need to do the work to sort of like dummy down these things, um, you know, make it more palatable more understandable you know not just sit there and say like you know um you know they should understand these things not everybody's going to business school but yet they're building business great businesses out there for instance right so i think work needs to be done on both sides i don't know who's going to bite the bullet first but you know <laughs> something has to happen um and then also on the entrepreneur side one of the things we've seen particularly and i'll focus on early stage businesses is that there needs to be an increased um, focus on financial literacy because I think at the bottom line, really, numbers do not lie, right? So really being able to understand what, you know, what, what is happening with your business in regards to cash flows, your revenues, your earnings, your forecasting, all of those things, at the end of the day, I think even if they speak gibberish, numbers will not lie. So I think there needs to be definitely efforts with regards to financial literacy. Oh, sounds good. And I think uh, to sum up everything that everyone has said, I think this is very good advice. And we are definitely able to do uh, more with less uh, as we as, as the topic was. So with uh, advice on financial literacy, being able to incorporate that, being able to not take no and uh, just being determined and doing uh, what you can uh, and continuing to, to grow yourself. And then also just reaching out to your friends and networks uh, as Philip has alluded to. And just all these things that are really good for, for the business or are uh, good for the ecosystem. Uh, just equipping yourself with the knowledge, equipping yourself with the skills to be able to fundraise, uh, and not only fundraise, but also, uh, as, as Philip had also mentioned, just matching yourself with the right investor. This is, really, is, is going to be really important. 
uh, is we see that uh, different people want to invest in different things. And so being able to match with the investment sector that they want to, to, to do that in. So uh, I think we've, we, we are at the top of the hour. And uh, thank you very much for joining us. And um, do look out for uh, our other sessions in the South Cup uh, Summit. Uh, this you can find online on, on our social media platforms and uh, all our and, and our website. Thank you very much and uh, goodbye. Bye everyone. Thank you. Goodbye. Thanks everyone. Have a great afternoon.